Okay, so um, shall I go ahead and give a little bit of introduction to why we are doing these calls? Um, basically, is uh, sort of a pilot <laughs> test series of open climate calls uh, where we are sort of trying to understand the relationship between the open movement at um, the climate crisis. So it's a little bit of a set of exploration calls. Um, we had two of these calls already, and this is the third one um, with Lisa and Alex, um, well, and also Emma from CDKN um, and Alex from the Wikimedia Foundation. And the last two you can find uh, on the Appropedia page that Shannon just uh, shared there or that I will share in a moment. Um, and we're also doing a little bit of a summary of these calls uh, on Medium. And uh, the idea is that uh, we are convening these meetings, um, sort of like exploring a set of uh, questions. And so for this uh, conversation, we have um, Alex Stinson from the Wikimedia Foundation and uh, senior strategist from the Wikimedia Foundation, and then Lisa McNamara and Emma Baker from the Climate and Development Knowledge Network um, and South South North. Um, I hope I introduced you too correctly. If not, please feel free to correct me. Um, so Lisa, do you want to go ahead? Okay, great. I think, I'm not sure if it was my connection, but I will just share my screen quickly. Um, can you see that? Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm just going to be talking a bit about our experiences around what we're seeing as like key knowledge gaps in our work. So it's very much from a program implementation perspective, as opposed to so quite, you know, we're working with with kind with developing countries and with decision makers and a range of different actors in, in these places. So it's very sort of decision led kind of um, gaps that are emerging rather than content gaps at, per se. So I hope that's okay. Um, and I can talk a bit about our audiences as well. And uh, so I suppose these are more than global level gaps. They're more sort of region, country level, local level gaps. But I think there's a lot of crossover across, across the board actually. Um, so just a brief, background cdkn has been going for 10 years we're a network um we're very much focused on knowledge brokering recently um we have re three regional offices we work in africa asia latin america and we are funded by uh, the canadian government idrc and the dutch government and we are very much focused on trying to link knowledge and action on climate change we do a lot of knowledge tailoring. We work with um, work, we work in nine focal countries, and we try to match it to needs. And so we're very needs driven and very demand driven. And we also we also focus on supporting peer learning, leadership, empowering of champions in the global south to act on climate change. So our engagement uh, thus far in the open movement. Um, we did for a number of years uh, convene the Climate Knowledge Brokers Group. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with that group and it really was an alliance of the global, regional, national knowledge brokers um, across, uh, across the world. And the aim was to improve access to climate information through collaboration of knowledge brokers. So a lot of projects emerged from that and a few, a few um, nice um, initiatives. And now the, the group is being hosted by We Adapt. It has scaled down quite a bit, but it's still going um, to an extent. And then now more recently, CDKN has been engaging and that's how we came to meet meet um, Alex and Evelyn through the work we've been doing in dabbling with Wikipedia, which has been really exciting for us. And we've been working with our sort of sister program, Future Climate for Africa, which is a science program focused on the region and improving science um, in, in, on Africa, climate science on Africa. And we've been really focusing on trying to directly support climate researchers and experts in the global south to contribute to wikipedia we had a face-to-face -face africa event 
uh, back in the days when we could meet face to face. And then we had a, a seven day online editathon last year, Wiki for Climate. Can't believe it's last year already. And we've also produced a, a guide, which Evelyn's very, very um, thankfully translated into Spanish for us. Um, and I think updated and probably improved a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on for, specifically for climate professionals on how to contribute to Wikipedia, because we saw this real gap that, that, that you know, the climate community hadn't really sort of gotten to grips with the Wikipedia and uh, power of the Wikipedia tool as a communications tool. So some, some nice impacts from that is that this is a sort of a testimonial from a blog written by a participant of Wiki for Climate, Sumana, and she's a researcher in India, and she wrote a blog on her experiences and was totally unsolicited, and this just gives you a sense of the, the, the sense of empowerment that she felt, and um, being able to contribute to this global platform and share her, you know, her research and the research she, she came across. Um, and her local evidence base on a global platforms, which I thought was really nice sort of illustration of the importance of, of bringing new contributors to, to Wikipedia. So where are we seeing key kind of knowledge gaps? I think a lot of this is not really new. We know this. Um, increasingly, climate researchers, particularly in the adaptation space, are calling, a, calling for more people-centered place-based knowledge that can really integrate with the top-down modeling being done. And it's messy, but um, this, this bottom-up, top-down integration really needs to happen um, urgently and at scale. So in terms to, to take that to more of a granular level, of course, there's, there's still a lot of need for the science, but highly applied we're finding, you know, at very downscaled um, levels, national, subnational, where people, you know, where decision makers can plan at a national, subnational, municipal level, at watershed level, and really tailored in very um, accessible formats to needs. There's a lot of, still a lot of climate risk, it seems obvious, but information on, on local and district level vulnerability and risk is still something that's very much needed and um, tools to do that effectively are very much needed and often very process heavy um, uh, to really map out the, the vulnerabilities and understand them. There's a lot about what works, what's working, um, you know, what, what, what adaptation and mitigation best practices, technologies, innovations are working. Um, and I, Appropedia is, is, is like a nice, interesting um, platform for that and um, yeah so so there's really lots of need for that intersectionality more and more and more how is climate change impacting different social groups and genders and not just men and women but ethnic minorities and transgender communities and if you know people with disabilities so there's a whole really sort of becoming more nuanced in how we understand the community um, Indigenous knowledge systems and how they can be integrated and often this it's oral oral knowledge we're talking about this deep, deep need for for information in different languages, which I know the Wikipedia community is very familiar with that we are encountering all the time and as soon as we do something in, that's not English, it just flies. <laughs> um, and then climate 101 really for for local community groups, I think there's. There's actually quite a lot of need for understanding the big picture um, with local community groups and you know that there's quite a lot of demand for understanding how the negotiations work how the negotiations work what is my what is my what is my government doing to respond to climate change um, and the sort of climate 101 for those groups so we know there's like there's definitely a huge upsurge in activity around the open movement I know last week we were in the in um, knowledge there's a, a project called CE4 CAP, I'm not sure if everyone, KE, not CE, familiar with the knowledge exchange between climate adaptation platforms, there's quite a lot of learning and sharing there. A lot of the platforms were sort of European and Canadian based, um, but lots of interesting stuff and very sophisticated tools actually. Um, and then CDK is just working now with the 
global resilience partnership on a sort of resilience knowledge coalition to try and get global actors together to focusing on resilience um, to to try and you know take take um, resilience to scale supported by climate information so the question being like what does this mean um, for for us working in the global south and with developing countries how can how can the open movement serve serve the interests of of the decision makers and the ngos and the the private sector organizations we're working with um and what we are finding a lot of is that you know, format and process really matter so this little simple poster that we we um did is in is in a local language in local namibian language on the implications of 1.5 global warming for namibia and it's got like just a little bit on the science, it is the most recent science um, for different um, subregions of Namibia and a little bit about what you can do and a little bit about the risks. And it's, it's, it's up in all the district official regional level offices and people are really responding to it. And it's actually, it's a very simple thing, but it's actually having quite a lot of impact and um, more impact than we, than we expected. And then also just user driven really important that um you know we the more user driven something is often um the more impact and the east african grain council have also just launched a tool where they um they provide weather forecasts with different recommendations on when to start planting harvesting performance performing post-harvesting activities and this is in the um in east africa and this this whole the, the tool arose from um, engaging with farmers, and it's been designed in response to the exact format format and content that they require. So, what does this all mean? Um, well, just from our vantage point as CDK, and is an, an enormous opportunity um, for the for the for the open movement to really like respond to this gap about more place-based context relevant knowledge more available and more actionable that is from from my perspective where there's this real leverage point that that, that we can respond to um we're very passionate about really getting climate experts and researchers in the south to contribute in a very active way know how to engage with the open movement learn how to contribute to platforms like wikipedia it's going to be a long it's a long it's a long process but i think it's really something that's that can pay dividends um I, what i really really think is so important particularly with wikipedia is the ability to work across languages and all our editathons have been in english because we haven't had the capacity or the bandwidth to do it any other way but this is just you know in all in, in terms of this place-based knowledge it's some, such an amazing opportunity and then country level you know when i look at all the amazing open data platforms available at a global level I just think about how can we how can we make this work at a country level and and how can the open movement support this and there are they, I know WRI has just launched a study on um, climate action and open data at country level and one important point that I think that study did make was that because of the enhanced transparency framework of the Paris Agreement it might be a good time now actually to to really uh, engage at a country level with open data because countries have to get their transparency systems um, sorted. So yeah, I thought that was quite a nice um, sort of opportunity there. And again, we just for these national initiatives to work, really need to be engaging local researchers and expertise. And then some of the barriers, I think that there are. You know, we know there's still a lot of sort of bias towards knowledge and approaches from the north and the digital divide we just published a paper on the digital divide in in the covid crisis and the, the for the climate practitioners working in the global south and how they've had to transition and it's like a, it, we, we we're dealing with some serious serious issues and the gap is just getting although you know we there the have been strides made so i say i say that and I, I know that you know we are we are the world is rapidly changing but some things still are very tricky to do in the global south. And then, then something that I have been grappling with a bit is this, this 
skepticism of researchers from the global south making their work freely available when they do you know you are coming with people with histories of colonial oppression there's a lot of inequalities in the north south research collaborations so there's a mistrust of this open movement story i think amongst researchers and how to like deal with that um and then yeah just you know a lot of sort of other barriers around awareness and capacity and technical um, technical capacity and legal frameworks, etc. But having said that, I still think, you know, obviously there's enormous opportunity, but just being mindful of these of these barriers as we're going forward. And that's that's it from me. Well, thank you, Lisa. This has been like really enlightening, and I think that it matches matches really well with the call that we had last month where there were some of the points that you're bringing up into this conversation were also made. So this is uh, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, okay, Alex, so now it's your time and try to keep it brief. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, so th thank you for uh, uh, doing this. And I'm really glad Lisa kind of put the context uh, in it because I, I approach this space from an activist role. Like I, I am an open activist. And so like the, the problems, the, my, my method of addressing it is thinking about like, what is the role of the open organization? Not so much like how does, like I don't start from the place that, that Lisa and Emma do at CDKN and their whole team of like, how do I work with uh, the people on the ground who who we already work with to think about the open space. Um, so to, I, the, the kind of broad question I have is where does Wikipedia play a role as an open platform? What does it do? Um, and it, it, this all starts with a place uh, in the Wikimedia movement that, that we believe like Wikipedia and the other Wikimedia platforms are, are places to address topics for impact. Um, so this is kind of the, the first place where I, I start with, which is like when we do open the most persuasive place to start is somewhere where activism, where there is impact um, through activism on the platform in some way. Um, we, we've seen this with the Wikimedia movement, the gender gap has been really mobilizing uh, for our communities and has brought a diversity of new projects into the movement, even in spaces that are not gender explicit. For example, a lot of our tactics for, for the afro descent communities were kind of developed at, as kind of uh, on the edges of the gender uh, movement in the Wikimedia space. And so it's, it's kind of like interesting to think like where are the activists, how do the Wikipedia platforms kind of do this work and how do we, how do we kind of use that to grow open content? Um, uh, the, so climate is of course really important powerful. Um, I, I did some data analysis last year looking at um, kind of where the, the climate and sustainability topics on Wikipedia were, were happening. And right before COVID, um, we were starting to see a spike of page views on English Wikipedia to these climate related topics. And then there was a crash. Um, and so the public was looking at Wikipedia for climate information because climate activists were doing effective communication out there in public spaces and people were asking questions. And then it, this is something we saw in the whole climate communication space, COVID kind of hid that conversation and we're only now starting to see that recovery at the end of last year. And this is true on Wikipedia page views. We also know that unlike other topics, so usually English Wikipedia is like the dominant uh, source of page views in every shape and form on, on, on Wikipedia platforms. Usually it's over 50% of the page views, but we know on climate topics in particular, 60% of the page views are coming from other Wikipedias, um, other languages. So this, this like shift towards uh, really local um, uh, content is is really quite important. Now it's there's many 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 more pages in these other languages than on English. So like if you're just going to solve one thing, like improving the English Wikipedia page hits more people. But all these other languages are really like people are asking questions. And I was looking earlier at the Paris Agreement articles um, across different languages, and and the Persian one is the third most popular uh, page about the Paris Agreement. They're trying to uh, like the the Farsi Persian language um, is is 
only spoken by a relatively small part of the global population, but because there's not a lot of other climate knowledge um, in Persian, that those kinds of pages are really valuable. Um, and so uh, we're, we're starting to see diverse community groups kind of organize around this. Uh, the CDKN event uh, was kind of the, the one in 2019 was the one to kick it off. But we've seen kind of subsequent activity by a lot of community groups and NGOs um, and our local community. So on the bottom left, that's our organizers in Nigeria looking at climate activist articles, because that's something that, um, uh, you know, when the news hits about climate activism, people look for like, who is this person, right? Who is Vanessa Makate? Who is um, uh, Disha Rabi uh, in India? Who are these folks who are, are standing up against governments? Uh, and biographies are often a place where people start. But you also need to connect it to the science and to the politics. Um, we did an experimental call to action in the last month or so um, with UN Human Rights and UN Environmental Program called Wiki for Human Rights that focused on like, how do we get the human dimension uh, kind of reflected in the climate crisis uh, through that right to a healthy environment framing. And it worked as far as we can tell. Um, it, it's, it's scaled up in a nice way from other events. We created over 800 articles uh, from the UN identified list of topics. Um, at least 300 more articles on climate, human rights, and other related topics on many Wikipedias. So it, this is a good example of where intersectional topics really worked. Uh, Macedonian Wikipedia did not have basic human rights articles. And so much of the content they created were like on other human rights topics. And they added that environmental perspective along the way. Um, we also saw Wikimedia communities were able to convene a lot of different events, including a webinar on Arabic language television in Sweden uh, this last weekend that had 3,500 uh, people uh, watching in Arabic uh, from a Swedish context. And so we, we know that our communities are able to reach like new audiences like as an open movement because of this angle of sustainability and climate and human rights. Um, and it's also allowing us to put kind of technical concepts into uh, languages that probably would not be describing them. Um, so on the right is the right to a healthy environment as a concept. And on the left is uh, the Eskazu Agreement, which is a major uh, human rights treaty that just came into effect on Earth Day uh, this last year in, in Latin America. And uh, now the Eskazu Agreement's in 17 languages. The concept of right to a healthy environment is in 24 languages. And uh, you know English and French are the dominant page views for right to a healthy environment. But Russian Wikipedia is up there behind it, right? Um, interesting, a, a, a human right kind of frame uh, in the Russian language is something that, that is of appeal um, to a broader public. Um, so we're still learning though, like what, what is the best way to approach this? Um, and, and to do this, I'm actually working on fictional personas right now based on the audiences we've interacted with. Like who are these people? um that we we either reach out to as organizers um so so in the movement we have organizers and editors organizers convene people editors create content and i'm trying to describe who we're seeing show up in these events um so that other open communities uh, wikimedia communities first but also other open communities can kind of think about who is your audience for the doing part of this. Um, what we're finding on the organizer side is more like journalists and activists and uh, INGO folks like Lisa and Emma who are able to convene uh, uh, people in the cl like climate adjacent spaces. On the editor side, it's a mix of kind of youth activists and experts um, and kind of existing Wikimedia communities wanting to get engaged in these topics. Um, and it's it's really an interesting mix that we we haven't quite had outreach like this. Uh, again, the, the best reference for it is the gender gap work, um, which has a much clearer target audience for the contribution. It's like women who uh, want to see women's biographies <laughs> reflected in the world. Uh, and that's like every woman. Uh, so it, it's, it's a much broader kind of space. Um, whereas when we're thinking about these more targeted topic areas, like who are these folks? Um, and we also have a challenge identifying 
like high impact that is not clearly science. Uh, a good example of this is like the Greta article and the David Attenborough articles on English Wikipedia drive like huge amounts of page views. It's like half a million page views a month. Um, and uh, like those aren't necessarily going to be impactful articles uh, like David Attenborough and Greta Thunberg are very popular people, but that that's not the information that makes a of like someone change their their policy get to the lowest kind of common denominator policy decision um in like a country or a place and so we're also finding these like national level articles or some of these kind of more specialized ones like climate change and children are like have much fewer page views but the the kind of intended audience for it is much more impactful. Um, and so finding the right balance between like, I need you to write an article about something really broad that we think will be in the news versus like something really local and impactful um, is the thing we're trying to figure out right now. Um, and it's it's challenging to plan because the, the insight and tools for this is not something that like Wikimedia communities have. Um, and it's not always transparent where the public is looking for climate information. Um, so this is kind of like the uh, like a big platform like Wikipedia is is not always in a good position to see this knowledge gap. Um, so that's kind of my kind of brief introduction of what I'm thinking about. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to kind of, you know, whatever questions are in the room and dialogue, I, th I think it's interesting to think uh, uh, about like where the kind of more practical implication implementation of this work that Lisa is doing um, uh, kind of intersects with this kind of global perspective as a movement, like how do we create space um, for, for this kind of work? And Lisa, that article is brand new. It was written by one of the editors that participated in your event last fall. Actually, she came back for a wiki for human rights. Yeah, and, and also like interestingly enough, we also like uh, someone translated it into Spanish, but um, it's kind of an interesting thing to see because they translated all without using the gender neutral form. So it's it re it reads really weird. <laughs> so connecting gender and, and climate there too. Um, okay, so um, I don't know if there's any question on the chat. I didn't see any um question there um i don't know if any one of the group uh wants to uh start or you know reflect a little bit on what alex and lisa shared lisa i'm um i'm really interested in uh, kind of towards the end of your talk, um, you mentioned the mistrust and hesitancy of researchers in the global south um, in participating in you know uh, different places where open shows up. And I'm I'm just wondering if you could reflect on that a bit more, and um, if you see any. Sorry, I'm also managing the weight room. Um, if you see any uh, kind of direct strategies for you know how to address that, I guess. Yeah, I think that I must say that in in the editathons that we've had and the engagement with researchers, there's actually been by and large quite an open, um, particularly from African researchers, quite an open um, attitude to sharing to sharing um, their work. But we are mainly, you know, dealing with. Um, academic literature as opposed to data. But I think when we get into the data realm, um, then it becomes a lot more um, tricky and proprietary. So so I think it's, it's a mixed bag. It's a mixed bag. Um, but I think the, the issue is that particularly and this does happen in the in the climate research realm is that there's often these big climate research programs and the southern partners are there to do the field work or they're sort of like the data laboratories and then the northern partners are often the leads and you know there's it's, it, the inequalities exist in that relationship um, and there's a lot of power symmetry so there's 
I think there that, you know, in that kind of situation, researchers from the South one, they want to hold on to their data. They want to like really make sure that, that um, they're recognized for the work and the efforts. Um, so I think that as long as there is that recognition um, and that it's not transactional and not a sort of fly in fly out mode and just like extractive, one can get it right. Um, but I think it's just one needs to be very mindful of it that 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 it's not um, an apolitical space. That it, it it does come with 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 issues. And there, I just came across quite an interesting um, piece actually that I can share um, here. But this was mainly for the. Um, the health sector, biomedical research, which is also different. So, but I thought it was well articulated how, yeah. Uh, Lisa, I think um, you share the like, link to your folder. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, Open data. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Um, it, so something we we've also seen in the larger Wikimedia movement is if you create space for the kind of activist types who are learners, um, they they are um, they don't feel as much ownership of the the topic space per se and so they're they're also there to own so um like you need the experts for certain kinds of of knowledge and, and this is what was so good about like lisa's edit-a-thons but there's other kinds of knowledge um that you you can bring in through folks who are more generalist or are like active learners and so i think like part of the trick is finding the balance between like expert reviewed content and and kind of like things that other people can communicate. I think Kate has her hand up. So Kate, do you want to ask something? Shannon, you had uh, Luis going first. Go ahead, and then uh, Luis Felipe is after. Okay, sure. I didn't want to cut and go off. Uh, we sleep in. Um, yeah. So, so hi everyone. Sorry, I'm a little late. I think I joined one of these before, and um, I primarily come from the ocean world. So I'll pretty much always be on all of your climate calls, being like, "It's the ocean. Is the entire climate also?" So, um, just <laughs> assume that I've said that in multiple languages. Um, but I'm really interested, uh, Lisa, in um, this this idea of Wikipedia as kind of a conceptual a uh, way to build confidence in working in an open way and creating data systems and 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 getting valued for your contributions you know that open way of working um i was actually the the reason i was late is i was just on a, a big um global ocean dialogue about building trusted ocean data systems using citizen science collaborations and how do you build trust and how do you set up these trusted shared pieces and uh, one of the researchers who's part of the International Oceanographic Commission was talking about work that they did in Angola where they went and worked with communities who weren't even that confident in their data and he brought a team of scientists and data managers down to sort of work with them to say you know, your data are good, your data have value, you shouldn't let be intimidated by people who come in from anywhere and say your data aren't worth having, you know, you need to do these things to them. But, you know, there's these ways you can clarify and improve your data, but, you know, your data should be standing up against all of these other countries with their fancy northern logos and, and seals, and, and we should find a way for you to do that. So, you know, I am really curious about building these types, and I know Shannon is too, you know, like how do we actually build the systems that show people that they are getting recognized, they're getting value, but that in large, in many cases, the data become more valuable in aggregate, right? Like we need to know that entire coastline, not just any one country. I mean, I live in the US and Rhode Island's a lovely state, but really their coastal data are not valuable. That's tight, you know, it's two miles. We don't need your data, Rhode Island. We need, you know, 17 states who don't all get along. Um, so it's, you know, other parts of, 
of the, the world when we're talking about climate issues, we do need data collaborations. And, and I'm always looking for those models where people feel like they're getting recognized and not just getting their data kind of sucked into a pipeline where it doesn't get lost. So I'm just curious, you know, if, for anyone on this call, but for you and to like, how, how are we kind of creating that sense of value while still letting the da data be, you know, interoperable and findable, reusable? I have a good answer, but I'm going to put another example in the chat here too of a project that a friend I know uh, did for his PhD thesis in Mexico, which was trying to create uh, data object ident identifiers and also encourage the community to tell stories about how they gathered the data. So it's both a comms platform and a data platform. Very exciting. Yeah. I could respond if um, I think Max has got his hand up. No, I just I I think that's fascinating, and I agree that I think Wikipedia is an is an incredible opportunity to do collaboration, and I think in doing that collaboration and and seeing an immediate result, you know, it's not that that normally these collaborative projects you don't see immediate results, but you see immediate results on the page. That I think there's very there's a lot of power in, in in doing that and working with with it working with scientists in that way and that that's an incredible example that you've just given. So yes, concur and agree. And I, I don't know how we take I don't know how we take it to scale. I still will um, think about how that works. I mean, I was very interested in in the impact you had, Alex, with with this last um, human rights. I mean, that's that's impressive stuff. And working out how to do that and take it to scale um, is really the trick. So yeah, really working out what the formula is, and we still we're still working it out. Yeah, and um, so, so something. Uh, so my my kind of space of work is campaigns in the Wikimedia space is like how do you take something that works like at the editathon scale and turn it into something bigger while still being meaningful. Um, and we've had this experience in the library professional space where where we've needed to do like MOOCs where we like give librarians skills that are relevant to their professional practice while teaching them Wikipedia. Uh, so this is very, this is very like uh, opposite of where some of our community members want to do outreach where they're like, we want to teach you Wikipedia while we do something valuable for you. And uh, in the library space, we've done it the other way around. Like, what are the needs that librarians need? Um, and how do we use Wikipedia to facilitate that? Um, and so, uh, we're actually I'm in the process of funding a couple uh, projects where we want to look at youth climate activists um, as like an audience like that, where it's like, what skills do youth climate activists need? Right, because a lot of them are doing communication about the science and the environmental movement and that kind of stuff. And but they may not have like formal research training or they may not know how to read a like scientific article or they may not know where to look for for high quality scientific information about the climate crisis that we're facing right um so can you teach them those skills while teaching them to organize their communities to participate in an open space um and i suspect there's something similar for experts that we just haven't like figured out the formula um and this is a really good example of where I think the Wikipedia community tends to solve everything on like an editathon or like a generic partnership um, uh, when they do like do outreach. And you really need to specialize in the audience. Like, what are you offering that audience um, in doing it? And so th this is where like, I yeah, open communities could could learn. And I I think Kate, what you're talking about is that value add of the data part. Um, I think we need to think about like, you know, librarians need to understand how to explain to their patrons digital modes of knowledge production, right? Youth activists need to, to explain to their public, like decision makers, like here's the basics of the science and this is where you can find out about it, right? Um, and so for me, that's, that's the place of interrogation, right? Is like, who are the audience and how do we give them 
things that are valuable regardless of how they do it. Great. Okay. So Luis Felipe, do you want to go ahead and ask your question away? No. Uh, okay. So then um, I'll hand it over to Max. What's your question? Yes. Hi, thanks. Um, I actually had a question for Lisa and for Alex. So I'm not sure if I should ask them both or sort of one at a time. Um, oh, just ask away. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe well, actually, you I think uh, the question to Lisa is probably sort of related to, to, to Wikipedia in some way as well. But um, first of all, it's great. I mean, I'm really excited to look through your project in more detail um, and uh, sort of take a bit of a deeper dive to see where you um, what more about what you're offering. But my main question really was about your sort of definition of um, sort of data poverty. And um, one of the key things that I feel is, um, is, is really needed in a lot of these conversations is, uh, is the um, obviously access to data and the ability to, to sort of have decisions about what data is published is, is, is very important. Um, but the resources that are needed, whether it's the technical skills or even the material resources, such as computing power, energy, et cetera, that are needed to actually do the analysis on that data, that kind of data poverty, is one that I generally see is still quite lacking within the open community. Um, a lot of it is about the licensing and the publishing of the data. And I feel that that without looking at the um, other side of this poverty, which is the lack of resources to do something, to analyze the data, to build the machine learning models, et cetera, um, this just ends up feeding the incumbents, the ones with the big machines, you know, the big tech companies that are just able to really use this um, data for their own benefit without us being able to, us as an open movement and the communities that are producing this data really being able to benefit. So I don't know, I mean, this, it's, it's um, Wiki, Wiki, Wikidata has like offers some of this in terms of its, you know, the ability to do some queries and all that kind of stuff, but the heavier lifting in terms of the machine learning um, infrastructure that's needed um, beyond just the source code, but I mean the actual physical infrastructure needed as an open community. I don't know if that's something that you've been looking at or not, or what are your thoughts on that? So that was my question primarily, as I said to Lisa, but maybe Alex, you have some thoughts on that. And then I have a question for Alex as well about his presentation. Sure, big question. <laughs> um, I'm not, I'm probably not best placed to, I don't have the expertise to answer it, you know, um, comprehensively, but that is my sense from, you know, sort of being exposed to the open community to a degree and then working with, working with decision problems that it's the, getting from the data to the action <laughs> is a very long and complicated chain and it never mind the computing power, it's the technical expertise to use, to, to, to curate, to manage, to keep that whole system going. And why I think, you know, every national government that we work with really wants a platform. They want an uber wonderful um, platform that, that, you know, they can just put, put, data in day out, data out and and get and get the, the, you know how they're going to how they're going to implement x policy in this in this watershed but i don't um yeah i don't think we've cracked it and i mean i'm i, I would be curious you know i'm not, I'm not i don't know where you where you work but it would be interesting I, I, last week we i was attending quite a few um webinars of the Climate Adaptation CE for CAP um, program, where there's this sort of looking at collaboration of climate adaptation platforms. And I was really astounded at the, the level of sophistication, but you know, these are for you know, European um, users. And um, I think there were a few Australian platforms in there, but I just don't know if we, and I think it, it's problematic in that context. I mean, when I was listening to all the issues with just getting collaboration of users and producers, and, and it's complex, it's a complex data world. And doing that in, 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 a, in a developing country context, I think. So I don't know if that answers your question, except to say that, I, yeah, I think it's complicated and it's, it's um, to get to the decision level and for it to be useful and actionable is, is I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe Alex has some, maybe Wikidata. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't have an answer 
for this. Um, uh, we we ran into a problem. So this is from my cultural heritage kind of partnership work that I did, where a group of our community and Ghana digitized a whole bunch of stuff from the National Archive, but there was no repository to store it. Um, and they had to kind of like um, uh, kind of do a like open software evaluation of like what digital repository tools can we get and they like had to go you know across Accra to to a university library to get them to host the repository for the national library so like even even when there were open solutions in a sector that is like about storing data right that's what libraries do um the the kind of expertise and capacity did not live in one institution. Um, and so that 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 level of complexity um, is something that, you know, and, and this is where like talking to our practitioners in Global South, um, just like we can't pick up a partnership model that works in one space. And, and this is probably true of open data and climate data and stuff and like expect it to work elsewhere. Like we really need to start with like what is in your capacity and interest <laughs> now um and how can we support that and validate that um and like just endorse it um and so like one of the examples is our philippines community has been doing a lot of uh, translation work uh on wikipedia using the machine translation that we have been able to get access from like google and and the various other big providers of machine translation and like that has been super valuable to them because extreme weather in the philippines is a big deal and like local language context information about that is just not available right um and so that 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 kind of work you know we provide some centralized infrastructure that unlocks the ability for folks to do the thing locally max do you want to go ahead and ask your other question that you had yeah sure yeah no, thanks for the feedback lisa and, and, and alex and i think yeah it is i mean yeah the, i i wish obviously if i had answers you know, I'd, I'd be putting them forward but i think um I mean, one of the things I just wanted to mention that comes to mind is actually the work of Datakind in the UK. I don't know if you, I think they, they work in the US and the UK, datakind.org.uk is their website. Um, and and they, they, do, they, they do some work towards bridging the knowledge gap of helping organizations work with data. But again, it's, I mean, that, that which I think is a very interesting model that I wonder like how that can be applied in different, uh, in, in, in different areas. Um, but it's still, I mean, you know, that, that big one about infrastructure is, is I think, you know, that, that that maybe is something that sort of needs a UN level organization just because of the sheer cost and, and, and um, you know, uh, resources that are needed. Um, can I, oh, yeah. can I maybe add a response to that quickly, which is, I, I'm not sure if anyone else, how much other folks have worked with the Open Data Institute at, in the UK, which also does a lot of data literacy training. Um, but we've been having, and when I say we, I'm putting on my hat of working with the World Economic Forum and the UN Decade for the Ocean, we've been having some initial conversations with them about, tra about translating some of their work on uh, data ethics and data strategy, some of their existing trainings to be specifically for people working on coastal and ocean resilience issues. And can we also translate them into multiple languages? So I am curious if anyone else has worked with them or thought about repurposing their tools because one reason that we are looking at doing this with those groups is that the international development banks, the Global Economic Fund, some of these other um, investment banks are sort of saying, well, if you can tell me what Trinidad needs for a coastal ocean data system, we will fund it. But until they can tell us you know, what they're looking to build. So it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation. So we're wondering if we can use things like, you know, we could use whether it's working with Datakind or ODI or somebody who sort of already has these trainings in like data strategy and data system assessment to see, you know, we wanna monitor this, this is what we care about. This is what we wanna build. It's gonna cost us this much money, who's in? Because we're hearing more and more that people, public and private are in for that. If if someone could just articulate it as a shopping list. I, so I, I mean, I, I do want to make a small point about like being very careful when we talk about like 
um, sort of like, I, I, and I know that Max is right about it, sort of saying, you know, there's like a problem with the gap between the like computing power and all those things. But I also want to be like caution, like uh, like bring a word of caution around like treating everything as if it were the same, right? Because there are like, you know, there are small countries that really struggle with like getting this data set, but then there are like, you know, middle income countries too that do have some capacity installed, right? So like, uh, I, I wanna just be cautioned about like putting everyone like that it's in the global south into the same bag of things, right? Of like lacking, you know, capacity and resources, right? Um, I do think that there's also, you know, coming from um, like Latin America, I know that there's like some like, some governments are very cautious uh, whenever it comes to dealing with NGOs and like this sort of institutes, right? So they rather do stuff through other partnerships and alliances that they already know of, like, you know, the open government partnership, I think that's one of them. Um, and like the uh, climate, like the cities for climate, I think that they are also like sharing that after those like spaces, um, but yeah. Um, so Max, do you wanna um, um, ask your uh, last question for Alex or? Sure, I, yeah, if I'm just checking, nobody else has their hands up, but yeah, it's okay. Um, just a quick uh, one actually, because uh, Alex, I, I know you and I've had conversations about this in the past, but I, th I found what I found really interesting about what you said was the way in which uh, you found a lot of people were using Wikimedia as a way to sort of look up activists in these networks um, especially in areas where you know it, it, uh, non-English language, um, and where where it might sort of be a little bit more difficult to find information about these activists um, elsewhere. And I was wondering, I mean, as you know, we've talked about this before, but you have certain um, uh, language communities, such as Wikipedia Arabic, is the one that I'm familiar with, that are um, that that has a very sort of deletionist type of approach towards. Um, uh, uh, articles and a lot of activists in a lot of areas. I, I can't speak for climate activism actually, but I know that in a lot of other areas we've talked about, a lot of activists just get their pages deleted before they even get started because of the approach of the admins in that um, in that language. And I was just wondering if that's something that you think you, the way that you approached your analysis, it can surface sort of correlations between these kinds of uses, which I think are great uses of Wikipedia and sort of the language communities that have more of a deletionist versus an inclusionist type of approach? Um, th this is part of the reason I want to get away from biography writing um, and the movement more generally, because um, like who is relevant is a political choice uh, in most contexts. And even the like gender gap community um, gets uh, work, uh, but, but it's, it's very hard to pivot towards the kinds of work that Lisa and Emma were doing, because you have to recruit the right, um, the right audience, right? You have to have the right experts in the room to write all of the climate stuff about, you know, the the whole continent of Africa, uh, versus like a country level thing. And so the um, uh, Elizabeth von Munch who organize, helps uh, the, organize the Wiki for Climate event and the Wikiloads SDGs event. Um, and I have been experimenting a lot with how do you find topics that are in that medium complexity space uh, in this topic domain? Like what, what's the thing between the biography and like the main climate change adaptation article <laughs> um, that like would make meaningful impact? Um, and we're trying to pivot towards that, um, but the tools for doing that are not there in the Wikimedia community yet, so it's still very artisan. Uh, you still have to, like, have a gift at finding those topics <laughs> uh, to, like, set up the conditions for newcomers to participate um, and experts to participate in that. Uh, so, yeah, and, and Lisa, I don't know. Like, what was your experience with kind of finding the right topics with the right impact for the audience you wanted to recruit for for the stuff? <laughs> it was quite a process, I have to say. I'm just so glad you and Elizabeth were around. 
I mean, Emma, Emma, yeah, Emma's silently. <laughs> yeah, we worked hard. We worked hard on that. We had to really think about it very carefully. And, you know, I mean, even saying that, I think we do things maybe a little bit differently um, next time. But there's a balance between, yeah, those, those, those articles that are really high impact versus, the, versus you know, those, those that are more kind of doable and that you won't likely have your edits reversed. And I think the nice thing about the environmental topics um, is that they're like globally acceptable to deal with. Like maybe five, 10 years ago, that might not have been the case, um, but now it is with like some very particular exceptions, uh, like, uh, you know, politically opposed uh, mining situations and very particular countries or you know that kind of stuff um for the most part and, and especially amongst our volunteers um who are kind of news savvy like the environmental issues are are less like the the thing about it is it's like a well-documented set of knowledge that has a very clear articulate gap on our platforms um which i think is very different than like if you were to work on LGBTQ issues or other human rights topics like free speech, um, you might end up in a, like, do I trust your documentation or not? Uh, argument, which is not where you wanna start newcomers um, in an open knowledge space like this. Great, we are uh, reaching the top of the hour. Um, this has been great. Um, and I mean, I still have like a lot of questions <laughs> around, you know, connecting this like sort of local evidence on the platform and then how that actually translates into climate action, right? Uh, but I guess that's something that we can leave for some other goal uh, <laughs> or some other conversation. Great topic for another call. <laughs> Well, you know, initially these were only going to be six calls, but we might need to extend them. Who knows, right? <laughs> um, well, thank you, Lisa and Emma um, and Alex for being here and uh, to all the other participants for being here too and bringing uh, so many interesting questions. And please remember that you can find all the information about the calls on the Apropedia page that we have shared there. Um, and yeah, watch out the space for our next call that is gonna happen, if I don't remember incorrectly, on the 22 of June? 29th yes. of June. T 22. 29th. Tw 29th, okay, right, 29th. So see you all there on the 29th of June. Great, thanks for the opportunity. Nice to meet Thank you, you all. You.